Assalamu alaikum and uh, very good morning. My name is Hizam Kadi and you, and you are watching Orbit Talk Series, streaming live to you from the Orbit FinTech Hub here in Bangsa South. We are very uh, extremely fortunate today to have a very special guest, a lady with an uh, illustrious uh, career at Bank Negara Malaysia, the first woman to be appointed governor and now chairman of Permodala National Berhad. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Dr. Zeti Aziz, welcome to Orbit Talk Series. How are you, Tan Sri? Uh, good, thank you. Alhamdulillah. I'm just very humble, very, very honoured to have this opportunity to be speaking with you today. And uh, we've been uh, gathering and accumulating questions from our friends in the industry. And uh, all of us want to hear your views and insights on uh, the current economy, uh, the process of uh, recovery, as well, uh, the much talk about and uh, we are coming from MDEC, it has to be on digital transformation. Maybe we begin uh, with the first question, Tansri, and uh, we'll talk about what's relevant currently with the pandemic. Um, how do you view, uh, and with your experience in the economy, uh, the current economic impact from the current pandemic, and how does that very much different from the financial crisis, especially in the late 90s? Right. Well, uh, this is a question that is in a lot of people's minds. Uh, how has this pandemic affected uh, the world and our, our own economy? Well, the world was not in a state of preparedness. <laughs> this pandemic was not anticipated and therefore uh, they were not in a state of preparedness to deal with it. And in terms, well, this crisis first is a health crisis. And the first objective has to be to contain uh, its spread. Uh, and as a result of that, there were economic shutdowns throughout the world. And this shutdown has had a major immediate effect on economies around the world. And this is, so this has become uh, a health crisis, and then it translates into a humanitarian crisis because people's lives have been affected by it, and then an economic crisis all at the same time. And as a result of the shutdowns that were taken throughout the world, economic shutdowns, uh, it has resulted in um, no economic activity and this translated into an economic crisis and most countries around the world have seen a major economic contraction in the first half of the year. Yep. Now we can then say that, that given the, the reduction in the restrictions uh, or movement and resumption of economic activity that has taken place, that now uh, th there is economic activity taking place. However, we can, although we can say categorically we've seen the worst now, and that we should see a recovery happening in the second half of the year mm -hmm. and going into next year with a stronger growth. Mm -hmm. However, all this is on the assumption that we don't have a second wave. So the first objective of any policy is when we see some sporadic clusters emerging, uh, these need to be contained immediately mm -hmm. so that we do not have a, a, a second wave of shutdowns and then uh, economics, further economic setbacks. One of the main consequences of this is also the higher rate of unemployment. Exactly. So while there has been a resumption in economic activity, it's not commensurate with the recovery in employment. Mm -hmm. And what is of concern is the high rate of unemployment amongst younger people. Mm -hmm. And this is of great concern. So if we ask the question, how is this crisis uh, different, different from uh, the crisis we experienced 
20 years ago, exactly uh, almost 20 years ago, 22 years ago to be exact, in 97 and 98. And actually, Malaysia did very well uh, uh, in emerging very well out of that crisis. What sort of crisis was it then and how does it compare with now? Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, it was due to waves of capital outflows. And it happened over a period of time. It happened in the, as a result of contagion of outflows in many of the countries in uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia and in Asia mm -hmm. as well, Greater Asia, where we saw these outflows. And these outflows didn't happen just once in a discontinuous m manner. It happened uh, throughout uh, the months and sporadic, and it led to collapse of our financial markets, mm -hmm. uh, capital markets, and the exchange rate uh, collapsed in many countries in this region. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, those holding financial assets began to feel, became in distress. And then you had a financial crisis. And as the financial institutions stopped lending in that kind of environment, uh, then you had an economic crisis. Mm -hmm. So it happened over a period of time. And when it happens that way, as a, a regulator and policy maker, you are forward looking and therefore you look at scenarios that could happen uh, down the road and you can implement policies to preempt uh, what is happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is exactly what Malaysia did. Mm -hmm. uh, we restored stability in our financial markets and got quite criticized for the kind of policies that we took, uh, described now as unconventional, unconventional policies, policies. But others have done that in their crises too. And um, so uh, we, uh, and we dealt with stressed financial institutions and they commenced lending. And as a result of that, we had a V-shaped recovery. Mm -hmm. Now, the economic contraction happened in 98. Even though the waves of capital outflows happened in 97, uh, 97, we still had a growth of 6 7%. Uh, but by the time it continued into 98, and when the banks stopped lending as a result of their financial stress, uh, then that was a time when the economy started contracting, and the economy contracted by 7%. That was the first contraction, and I was acting governor at that time, and I had to make the announcement the first time in our history. Yeah. Now, how does it compare with now? Okay. Well, the economic contraction that's being projected for this year, and by uh, aside even by Bank Negara, but the World Bank and the IMF, it is in the range of minus 3.5 to 5.5%. 5 okay. mm -hmm. So the economic contraction, while very painful because it happened within a very exactly. short period of time in the first half of this year, is less than the contraction experienced during the Asian financial crisis 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you're having a, a situation where uh, the potential uh, for recovery is from a less worse situation uh, than previously. Mm -hmm. But perhaps maybe in this particular case, the unemployment might be higher. Got it. Uh, yes. So uh, this is why policy needs to recognize this and uh, uh, address this point. Mm -hmm. But in which case, uh, I also want to make a point because there are some multilateral agencies that have said um, countries like Malaysia in Southeast Asia or even in Asia in general need to brace themselves for a financial crisis. This is not a financial crisis. This is an economic crisis. All right. And moreover, yes, the reasons that they gave is uh, many businesses uh, will not be able to service their loans uh -huh. and then as a result banks will suffer losses. Well, uh, they need to recognize that after the Asian crisis, 
all of us in Asia, and in particular in Southeast Asia, strengthened our banking institutions through uh, restructuring, rationalization, consolidation, and reforms, uh, financial reforms, all of it which has strengthened. So our financial institutions go into this crisis from a position of strength, and therefore they are ready, able to absorb uh, some of these setbacks. And I do not anticipate a financial crisis in which there's a disruption in lending, which would be vital for our economic exactly. recovery. So in essence, we have what, as an economist, we would describe good initial conditions. And one of them is a very strong, well-capitalized uh, financial system, a banking system in particular, with their provisioning standards and their level of capitalization, their level of profitability before this crisis. Mm. So I'm one of the more optimistic yes. ones that uh, we are in store for a recovery at the second half of this year All right. and going into next year where this recovery will, will strengthen. All this is based on an assumption that we're not going to have a second wave. All right, touch wood. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Tansri. I, I love that optimism. Um, and you mentioned that uh, the banking sector has strengthened after the financial crisis. And this being more of an economic crisis, government has done quite a bit in terms of uh, combating and cushioning the impact yes. of the economic downturn. Uh, they are Panjana and Prihatin initiatives. A huge amount of allocations has been uh, put aside for the betterment and uh, the, uh, to increase uh, consumer spending as an example. Um, I want to hear your thoughts and views on uh, the work that has been done by, uh, by the government. And I know that it will not have any quick wins or any immediate impact, but from a longer term recovery process, uh, you know, linking it to your optimism that uh, second half will be much better. Yes. Well, um, the response to this uh, current crisis, as we can describe it as, uh, that, uh, that well, the first response has to be the health system and, and the containment of the spread of this uh, pandemic. But in terms of the economic response, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, traditional policies, that is the monetary and fiscal policies, uh, we have seen that they have been very prompt. Uh, we have seen, um, uh, well, I'm a Korea central banker, <laughs> and, and I will comment that uh, from uh, my entire experience, uh, these interest rates uh, now have been brought down to historical lows. Wow. We haven't seen this kind of level of I interest rates, I believe. And so this is a, a, a rapid response and a prompt response uh, to the current conditions uh, to make uh, access uh, to f financing, and not only that, for existing borrowers mm -hmm. uh, to uh, lower their cost. Uh, of borrowing, and then of course you had the moratoriums uh, uh, and so on introduced uh, to support and provide relief uh, to existing borrowers. Then the fiscal policy, again, I have never seen it before as well, so this is uh, historical highs of the fiscal stimulus, uh, I think exceeding now 20% of GDP. Uh, and uh, again, it has been very prompt and very quick to provide relief uh, to households, to businesses, and to those industries who are most affected uh, by this, uh, especially services industries mm -hmm. and so on, uh, who've been affected by this uh, consequence of this uh, pandemic. And so uh, they have done their part. Uh, and the most important part is uh, the implementation of it, exactly. that, that it, it reaches out uh, to those that require it. And, and um, 
the banks also provide it uh, is the channel through which uh, um, borrowers are affected. And we have many other mechanisms uh, to deal with debt restructuring and uh, at the household level, at the SMEs, small businesses level, and to the large corporates. Uh, those mechanisms exist. They were so successful during the Asia financial crisis uh, 22 years ago that we kept it in our system, these mechanisms, all these mechanisms. We have a resolution uh, uh, authority uh, with the Deposit Insurance Corporation, has all the Dana Harta, Dana Motel, is all embedded in that authority now mm -hmm. so that uh, they can be effectively implemented immediately, mm -hmm. but with the loan restructuring. So Malaysia has always been dealing with the problem, not only with the lender's side, like recapitalizing financial institutions, as was done 22 years ago, or dealing with the financial institutions so that they continue to perform their function, but also at the borrower's side. The borrower's so side. we have always been very extensive in our approach to policies. Mm -hmm. At this point, what I would like to see, perhaps, is more done with respect to unemployment. Uh, while, of course, it is businesses. When businesses recover, they can re-employ uh, uh, and um, improve employment conditions. But there's one aspect that's particularly important and the jobs might be different. Yes. Uh, and of course, uh, coming for you from the technology side, you know the skills required are going to be very different. So yep. there has to be a, a reform in the education system that will produce the kind of skills mm -hmm. that uh, is needed now mm -hmm. for the structural changes that are in the making. And uh, for those existing uh, workforce, uh, they need to be reskilled, retooled, and um, have uh, new skill sets, uh, really. And this has to be provided aggressively so that we have the right kind of talent and so that they can gain uh, new employment. Mm. You've led me to my third question, actually, with regards to uh, being inclusive yes. and uh, how technologies. Uh, playing a bigger role right now in accelerating the uh, economic recovery process. Yes. Um, you know, the subject on uh, employment yes. uh, and uh, how uh, critical skill sets are changing right now. Yes. Uh, your views and how technology plays that role, yes. especially in the context of digital economy or sharing economy, yes. in enabling uh, people uh, to address uh, unemployment through various forms of other digital means and digital working opportunities. Yes. yes. Well, the fundamental idea of pushing for inclusion is that we want balanced growth. Uh, we've seen in some economies, especially that are IT driven, mm -hmm. you know, you have very high rates of growth in that sector racing ahead. Uh, whereas uh, you have the other parts of the economy left behind. So overall, you have a great economic growth, but it's not balanced. What we want is balanced growth. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, this you've heard of digital divide and yes. so on. Uh, this is something we don't like to see happen. Yep. So we need to have all in place uh, uh, um, the uh, potential for other parts of the economy to participate in this growth process. At Bank Nagara Malaysia, of course, at the very early stage when we rewrote our Central Banking Act, after 50 years of central banking, we actually rewrote the whole legislation. Mm -hmm. And at one time when I was presenting this new legislation to the cabinet for, for their support. Um, they, they did say, 
uh, to, to show line by line w what are the differences. And, and I said, uh, you, you can't do that because I can take, take the, all the issues presented and what are not included and what are compared to the previous legislation. But the new legislation is a, a completely new for the change environment. And one of the new mandates that was articulated very clearly is that we wanted to build an inclusive and progressive financial system. Mm -hmm. And when you say inclusive financial system, that means everyone can participate or should be able to participate in the financial system mm -hmm. so that you can be brought through the financial se sector into the economic mainstream mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, financial inclusion for us uh, has been a very important part of the agenda. And the next step to it is, of course, to rely on technology to achieve that, the outreach. Of course, uh, we started off with a brick and mortar, having branches and agent banks who will go to directly to the households mm -hmm. and consumers. However, now the outreach is through technology and the education of with it comes uh, to show people financial literacy how do you use the financial system effectively mm -hmm. now in many senses the the first stage of it we have achieved amazing results like 92 percent of our population have some form of banking account mm -hmm. 95% said this is the latest number from oh, Nigara. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's even better. It's even better. Uh, yes. Uh, it's closely having 100%. Exactly. Uh, those were our ambitions. We are always very ambitious. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, it's uh, very exciting that such a high percentage. Therefore, actually, when you want to give relief to people, you can give it instantaneously. Uh, because you don't have to go around handing out the cash, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of people wanted to do. Yes, uh, <laughs> for different reasons. <laughs> yes, uh, because it's so I ineffective. Exactly. Because people have to queue up, and uh, then you know. Uh, so in this case, it's uh, and it can be given periodically uh -huh. rather than all at once, and then it's all spent, and then they don't have enough uh, to see them throughout the weeks and months ahead. And so it's an effective way uh, to just credit it to their accounts. So Malaysia already has in place uh, to do this. We have the foundations uh, to do it digitally. And then the communication, so it's the channel for the transactions, the channel for the communications. It's all there for the effective implementation of those uh, policies mm -hmm. digitally mm -hmm. and um, uh, but however we mustn't be satisfied just having people included in the financial system through having an account we, we, we need to be more ambitious than that they need to manage their monies more effectively yeah. what do they do uh, should they just place their monies in deposits or they, should they uh, try to earn something through investment in other asset classes uh, and the insurance penetration rate which is still low yeah. uh, should be much higher mm -hmm. and, and so on. So now the, the key word is effective participation in the financial system mm -hmm. and then you need businesses like micro-enterprises, the uh, small and medium-scale enterprises, to be more effective in their utilization of uh, financial services. Uh, and so financial inclusion is definitely an unfinished agenda. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's so much more that we need to do uh, to make the participation uh, more uh, effective. You mentioned about uh, Malaysia has done pretty well when it comes to uh, creating a bank populations. And as I said, latest numbers from Bank Negara 
has shown that we have hit 95%. Um, how would you see, uh, and you mentioned about beyond uh, bank accounts, yes. how would uh, a micro SMEs or uh, a B40 be able to sustain their financial sustainability in looking into investing in various asset classes? Uh, would digital, uh, you know, we are very familiar with solutions and offerings from the financial institutions, the insurance companies, the banks, uh, the investment platforms. They are currently uh, new sets of fintech companies yes. that are offering similar solutions yes. uh, and being able to enable that outreach even faster right. uh, as they are looking into helping uh, this underserved community in uh, increasing investment opportunities, yes. protecting themselves, yes. uh, and even more uh, of other opportunities across the spectrum of financial services. Right. Uh, your view on uh, how would you see digital financial services companies play a role, right. uh, whether it's hand in hand with the financial institutions, or would you see that there could be some form of disruption happening later on? Well, um, every aspect of digitalization is uh, disruptive. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, before uh, pursuing that, I also do want to mention that uh, when you talk about financial inclusion, one of the biggest uh, success uh, stories uh, of this is in Kenya, where they have Mpasa. Mpasa. Uh, and Mpasa means, um, is from the Swahili word, Pasa, as money, mm -hmm. and M is mobile. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so successful in the outreach that transactions could be made using the, the mobile phone and it, it penetrated far into uh, the rural areas and so on because everyone had a phone and they could transfer funds and receive monies for, for their products and so on uh, through this mechanism. And uh, I've talked to many people uh, who uh, know about this uh, and uh, they actually said that it was successful in Kenya because it was initiated by the central bank. Ah. And um, it's also been replicated with many African countries. But uh, a few other countries uh, did try to implement this and were not successful. In, uh, why was it not successful? The uptake wasn't so significant. Uh, so. Um, it is uh, really about how it is being implemented in a comprehensive manner and uh, it also receives the assurances and confidence of the users uh, that they have I I in the system. And I also want to mention that like in Malaysia, you, you have like Tabung Haji mm -hmm. uh, where it accumulates uh, 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 funds from uh, those who want to perform the pilgrimage. And um, many have tried to replicate it outside the country. Uh, now, apparently, there are some that are successful. But prior to that, uh, they found great difficulty. So the implementation of this and what is actually being offered and the education process, the infrastructure, and the confidence and trust in the system, in the integrity of the system, and knowing that there's some oversight uh, of the system and accountability. All these aspects are very important to ensure uh, demand mm -hmm. for, for uh, the product. Mm -hmm. And in terms of in Malaysia, uh, for example, the remittance service has been very successful. Yes. Uh, and uh, there are other financial services that have been taken up by others, even outside the banking, uh, traditional banking sector, have been successful. Mm -hmm. So, but it needs to be implemented uh, in a simple manner that is easily understood. And then it, it also needs to provide the assurance and confidence in mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. 
So switching gears uh, from financial inclusions to I think a topic that's very dear to you, Islamic uh, finance. Uh, Malaysia has long been recognized as a leader in, in, in Islamic finance and uh, very much due to your efforts, uh, Tan Sri. Uh, however, uh, this leadership somehow um, hasn't really rubbed its magic into building an innovative Islamic fintech industry. I mean, a lot of efforts are being put uh, into uh, building uh, a robust uh, industry around Islamic fintech. And I, 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 I strongly feel that there's still a level playing field in the whole entire globe. Um, given our positions in Islamic finance, how can we leverage on the current strength that we have in building and stimulating an innovation, uh, you know, innovations in Islamic fintech? Right. Well, uh, just like the priorities given even in the traditional banking sector, uh, the first building blocks of the uh, fin Islamic financial system also had to be put in place and priority was given to that first, to have the legislation in place, uh, took many years, mm -hmm. to give people confidence and uh, um, predictability of the outcomes uh, because of the uncertainty that prevailed, and then because it was something so new, and then to have all the building blocks, including the financial infrastructure the financial markets, the Sukuk market. We have one of the most developed yes. uh, in the world. A and then uh, the money market as well, so that liquidity can be managed. And uh, then the talent uh, with the expertise and the research uh, to promote innovation. But um, while they haven't uh, moved to that next phase, they have an opportunity with all these foundations strengthened. They can leapfrog and have a steep uh, uh, acceleration in the digitalization process to increase innovation in products offerings, to increase their operational efficiency, mm -hmm. to increase their outreach uh, in terms of channels. Mm -hmm that they have for Islamic finance, there are so many new opportunities. But one thing I'd like to say that, uh, as you may be aware, that at the very beginning, in the early 2000s, when we started uh, with this uh, development of this Islamic finance agenda uh, in our domestic financial system, and then uh, to Global. expand it globally, um, we found that even within our system, uh, the Sharia rulings was uh, very uh, divergent mm -hmm. I I in views. Mm -hmm. And then even within the, what we call Nusantara area, area in, uh, in um, the region, mm -hmm. uh, there were also divergent interpretations, Sharia interpretations. And therefore, we needed to work towards harmonizing in the region and then harmonizing globally. And when we set up uh, uh, and when we knew that our talent was also going to be poached, um, <laughs> yes, because everyone else then wanted to be an Islamic, international Islamic financial center from the developed financial markets to markets in the Middle East and uh, uh, international financial centers like Hong Kong and Singapore and mm -hmm. so on. And they looked at where the available talent was, and of course it was in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So we said we had to produce a pipeline of talent for the global Islamic financial system. And now, as it happens, uh, INSEF, which is uh, specialized to do this with the professional qualifications, uh, they have about uh, well, they had on the average about 2,000 students and uh, uh, from 80 over countries. A and now many of the graduates, uh, the two, 300 that graduate every year, are in key positions all, all, all throughout the world. Mm -hmm. But when we did this, we also wanted to encourage innovation aside from convergence of uh, Sharia rulings facilitating that. We also wanted to 
uh, promote innovation in offerings uh, by the Islamic financial industry. And so ISRA uh, Research Academy, Sharia Research Academy, was also established within INSEAD. And they put onto a portal, I can't remember the year when it was, but it was many, many years ago, mm -hmm. uh, of all the Sharia rulings. So everyone became aware of it uh, uh, throughout the world. Uh, and, it was, and their research and the dialogues amongst the Sharia scholars that were organized uh, contributed to facilitating now more than 80 or 90 percent of the interpretations uh, have reached uh, some harmonization, ah. uh, which is amazing. But they use uh, digitalization in having a portal uh, and working with some of the uh, um, uh, networks, uh, international networks uh, that existed to establish these portals. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of their research, the outreach of their research, I believe now they are ranked something like 33rd in the world where their research is being tapped into. And this obviously uh, can only be done digitally. Exactly. Uh, and so to be recognized in that way, uh, they did leverage on uh, technology. But I know what you're referring to is the digitalization of the operations yes. of the industry. And uh, this is something that I would also like to, to see happen, uh, that they, uh, just like their counterparts, and other industries that are similar in, to Islamic finance, like what we categorize as responsible forms of financial intermediation, like ethical finance and so on, they have leveraged on technology much faster and their outreach uh, has scaled up even faster. And therefore, uh, Islamic finance uh, should endeavor uh, to do this in their product offerings and in their channels of uh, outreach for their financial services. And some of the categories of, uh, um, like zakat, uh, that uh, is operated I I I in our own country, zakat, uh, waka, uh, and uh, sedaka, uh, all lend themselves to uh, uh, leveraging on technology for greater efficiency uh, in how it operates mm -hmm. and the impact mm -hmm. that it will have, mm -hmm. uh, not only in terms of its management of the funds, but in terms of its distributive effects. Okay. Uh, and uh, so this is something that we should uh, look forward to. Okay, we all look forward to uh, yes. a whole entire system gets digitalized. Yes. Um, the next question uh, will be more related to your current role as uh, PMB chairman, uh, or should I say chairwoman. <laughs> um, this is about the fintech ecosystems and the role of uh, government-linked investment companies such as PNB, um, technology has always been seen as uh, higher risk. And your views uh, for Glicks, the likes of PNBs, in investing in the higher risk asset classes like tech startups? Yes. Well, I strongly believe that um, tech startups should be supported mm. and they should be uh, within any country and we've seen it in some of our neighboring countries where these kind of startups mm -hmm. uh, have uh, been well supported. It's the whole ecosystem and the infrastructure, the legislation and the institutional arrangements uh, and uh, the um, IT infrastructure within the country, uh, the talent developed, and so on. These are the things that the whole ecosystem is required to. Uh, for PNB, we only have one mandate, and 
um, it's the most amazing thing to me because I come from an organization with, uh, uh, as a Korea central banker with multiple mandates exactly. and we actually have to uh, fight uh, for our voice to be heard in the international um, environment to tell everyone that we don't have a mandate just like some of the developed countries of a single mandate to uh, rein in uh, or to promote price stability because there are many central banks that just have that single mandate. Uh, the US at least has the mandate also of employment and growth of the economy. Uh, but in Bank Nagara, the, the mandate is very broad. But at PNB, we just have a single mandate. And that mandate is to enhance the wealth of our unit holders. Mm -hmm. So if the activity doesn't enhance the wealth of our unit holders, we shouldn't be involved mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we don't support digitalization. Uh, we should and we do. Uh, we work with the digitalized uh, companies uh, and uh, to further our own agenda of inclusion and outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the efficiency of how we conduct our investments and um, the operational efficiency of how we operate uh, it, to achieve uh, our mandate. Mm -hmm. And even within uh, PNB. I'm really pleased to say that um, we uh, are such an agile and flexible institution uh, that even within this year uh, that we adopt digitalization in three important areas this just this year alone. Mm -hmm. And of course with the, the COVID pandemic we wanted to ensure uh, that our functioning uh, in terms of our outreach to our, our unit holders, and we have 14 million yes. unit holders. I'm one of them. Yes. <laughs> and um, so our outreach to them, online transactions uh, that could happen during the, the shutdown period uh, and so on, uh, continued because we had it already in place. Now, uh, but to ensure our continued effective functioning, we had a change in working arrangements, work from home. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, 90% of our people worked from home. And to ensure the continued functioning of uh, PNB. And PNB, I believe, has uh, 1,600 staff. And so 90% of them actually worked from home for most of the shutdown period and our, uh, without compromising the effective functioning of our operations. So uh, that is uh, very good indeed. Of course, we have oh, um, continuity plans previously and all that, and they, they took effect as well. Um, but uh, so the first thing was working from home effectively. We showed the agility mm -hmm. of the organization mm -hmm. to leverage on technology to mm -hmm. do that, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the second is we introduced a new product. Ah. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you may know it, it's called Race. Uh, and uh, this was part of an innovation competition, internal one. So it was developed internally, and this staff uh, won the competition for, for uh, submitting uh, the proposal for this product. And initially, when I saw the list of things that we would be doing, and I saw this one down the list, and I said, no, let's put this at the top of the list. And the reason why, for me, who is not really digitally <laughs> savvy, as uh, the younger uh -huh. generation, um, I knew what outcome it could produce. And I, and I also knew that nobody else had done it. And we would have first mover advantage as well. And uh, this was to uh, mobilize small amounts of savings uh, for investment. Mm -hmm. 
and essentially what the product does was is uh, that uh, as you spend uh, the small change arising of your spending is investing it uh, so the tagline is uh, save as you spend I like that yes it's yes. wonderful and um, we work together with uh, uh, another entity uh -huh. that has uh, the expertise and proven track record. They've done it in Australia, and they've also done it actually in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we worked with them. But it also took a long time between the time that he, he submitted this and won the inno uh, prize for innovation. Uh, it took more than a year uh, to uh, to our regulator who went through and did the whole entire audit of the entire supply chain of the process. And uh, we just launched it very recently. Uh, so uh, we're very excited and uh, it's been well received by uh, the market. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's the second thing. And the third thing, I cannot say too much about <laughs> it, because it hasn't been officially announced. Okay. But wh what I can say, because a lot of people obviously know something generally about it, is that for 20 years, um, PNB had a uh, um, Mingu Saham. Uh, and every year we would have it. It would be one week of in-person uh, fair, mm -hmm. whereby uh, all our strategic companies would set up uh, booths, and we, during that week, more than a hundred thousand people would come in person, and there would be competitions and so on, for them to gain knowledge about uh, how to invest in unit trusts mm -hmm. and what kind of funds we have according to their different risk appetite and um, how they would go about it, and they would also know about where we invest their monies, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So there was a great discussion after 20 years of doing this, uh, and having a great uh, response of in-person uh, response. Uh, the suggestion was that we would do it digitally, mm. uh, and uh, we would uh, so there was a lot of discussion and there were two views on it, but the view that it should be done digitally uh, won the day, okay. uh, uh, thank goodness, because uh, with this COVID uh, exactly. that happened afterwards, there was no way that we could have it in person. Mm -hmm. So we had already decided before the COVID pandemic that we would do it digitally. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Today, later this afternoon, I, I'm going to be briefed on the final uh, um, aspects of this endeavor, which is going to happen later in the year. Mm -hmm. And soon after, there will be an announcement. All I can say is that it'll be uh, one week of great excitement oh, wow. of uh, digital Mingu. Mingu Sahab. Yes. Uh, so, um, the details of which you will learn later. We look forward to it. Actually. Yes. 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 You know, we spoke so much about accessibility. Yes. Um, we were pleasantly surprised as well. Recently, we had um, the sessions for the macro SMEs yes. in upgrading their skills uh, with regards to digitalization, and it was a pleasant surprise that the uh, it was very well received. Yes. That there was this urgency for them to be learning new skills yes. and understanding why and having this understanding why digital is crucial uh, yes. in helping them to grow bigger. Uh, switching the gear a bit uh, again, Tansri, uh, this is quite a sensational topic on digital banks. Yes. <laughs> the release of uh, Bank Negara Malaysia's uh, exposure draft yes. on uh, licensing framework for digital banks. Yes. I, I, I foresee this as, uh, as one of the biggest disruptions, yes. uh, if not this year. I mean, there's a lot of disruptions happening this year, yes. but at least in the decade. Yeah? Yes. What are your thoughts on digital banking and what kind of repercussions um, that would happen? Or would it benefit the financial institutions? And eventually, would it benefit consumers like me? Right. Of course, uh, digital banking uh, can also be d done by the incumbents mm -hmm. uh, because they have already 
over the years started with internet banking and then uh, greater uh, outreach leveraging more and more with digitalization uh, some less and some more uh, digitalized than others and then uh, what is also important is some have been more uh, supportive of uh, companies, uh, startups, w which is also very important. Uh, so this change has already been evolved, but uh, this uh, uh, digital bank and the potential for new licenses uh, in this respect, of course, it will be competition to the incumbents, and it all depends in their uh, ability to access the market, give offerings that there is a demand for, mm -hmm. uh, because as I gave the example earlier in Kenya, where it's very successful, and then some other, and many uh, African countries, but there are a few, uh, and I won't name the actual countries, where the take-up rate wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for the take-up rate to happen, uh, there needs to be first, uh, their offerings have to be competitive, cost-effective, uh, uh, and uh, that will be a factor. It's just like Islamic finance, where we offered it, we can tell the world that Islamic finance is able to meet with the demands that the economies have. Uh, the requirements, that the financial requirements, and Islamic finance is able to meet these requirements, and not only that, but at cost-effective yes. weather. And that is how Islamic finance has been sustainable. And the same thing for these digital banks. They have to be able to meet the requirements, mm -hmm. that means the, the demands of businesses, the demands of households, uh, what kind of financial demands uh, do they need to fulfill, uh, whether it's access or whatever product offerings they have, and uh, the speed at which they can provide it, uh, that they're not long delays as compared to uh, slow moving, uh, maybe that happens when it's in person or when you have um, signatures of documents and filling of forms. KYC uh, process. Uh, yes, uh, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to know your customer. But you have to also provide confidence uh, in the integrity of the system. Mm -hmm. That, in other words, the system is not going to be vulnerable by um, uh, uh, fraud or uh, insecurity. Uh, or it's not, uh, so one is uh, that it's uh, uh, got the confidence in terms of that nobody could hack into your account mm -hmm. and uh, take your monies mm -hmm. and so on, uh, that there's not going to be fraud. And um, then the, the second one also that it's not going to be vulnerable to money laundering. Uh, uh, and so all these have to be in place uh, for it to take off. And uh, for me, who was involved in putting all the building blocks uh, in place uh, for uh, um, Islamic finance and even for conventional finance, I know that it's a, a uphill task to have all this in place uh, for uh, digital banking mm -hmm. to, to succeed. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the oversight of the regulator that's also very assuring. Uh, for example, like PNB, we have the Securities Commission Commissions. as our regulator. And uh, like initially, for example, uh, an institution like um, uh, Tabung Haji didn't have a, a, a regulator, regulator, but I believe now they do. I'm not quite sure whether it's a joint regulator or a single regulator. But it is important to have another pair of eyes aside from your own governance process where you have a board oversight and then there has to be the education process and the talent available 
to s take this through uh, mm -hmm. as well and to see it scale up uh, because you definitely need scale I in order uh, to um, succeed. We are at the tail end of the discussion. Yes. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pose you a question. Uh, hopefully, we would have some time to discuss more uh, on uh, something that is impactful to you. Uh, is there an impact area that you would want to see faster uh, track of adoption in Malaysia, whether it's on healthcare or education, uh, what is one dear uh, area to you that you would see? Yes. Do you want the adoptions to become faster? Yes. Well, of course, uh, most of my life have been uh, for the financial sector, and we wanted to be build a financial system that best serves mm -hmm. uh, Malaysians. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't look forward to becoming an international financial center. We just wanted a financial center, the sector sector that best serves our uh, Malaysian uh, community and businesses. But um, now, having uh, gone through two master plans over 20 years, we actually have emerged quite well uh, mm -hmm. to have one of the best financial systems. So what else do I look forward yeah. to? Uh, of course, um, having a, a health system uh, and it is leverage on technology and uh, uh, is very important. Like in this COVID environment, contact tracing and uh, all the aspects of, of information, diagnosis and uh, uh, sharing of information and research on even how to cure. It, it can be cured much faster now mm -hmm. with the sharing of information globally and so on. But the other aspect that I believe opens the door and deals with most of our major problems is education, education, and education. And therefore, part of my life is uh, now being devoted to that aspect. And also, I cannot announce now, uh, but one project that we are doing, working on, and uh, inshallah, that we will have a, a chance of realizing it soon. We've been working on it for two years, uh, uh, almost, and it requires a lot of perseverance mm -hmm. uh, and defying all odds. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, feeding every child with a, a, a nutritious meal uh -huh. at primary school level, which involves 2.7 million children. And you'll be pleased to know that it's going to leverage on technology. It's uh, going to leverage on a blockchain-enabled platform to achieve this. And we have three objectives. One is to enhance the health of the children so that they're more resilient to illnesses. Second is to build their uh, physical frame uh, because we've been known in our country to have very high percentage of small framed. And this was true in Japan and Korea. Mm -hmm. And now you see that people are tr tall, tall and broad built frames. Mm -hmm. It's because uh, they, are, they, they feed the children the right food at, at the initial stage of their life. And the third thing is to develop the, the, their, cognitive, is their cognitive development so that they'll be smarter and their brain will receive food for uh, that is that will contribute to the development of their brain mm -hmm. and so this is a high impact uh, if it succeeds uh, yes inshallah it, it, it's a high impact uh, it will affect a, a generation our future generation uh, so um, uh, in supporting the education and health as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. I'm assuming when it's launched, and it will require a lot more participations from corporates, industries, yes. even people at large would be able to uh, contribute yes. as well. Yes, and because it's a blockchain-enabled platform, they will know how every cent uh, is spent because we are go they will also know from the, produce the whole supply chain mm -hmm. of providing the food for the child, the pro food producer, the people who prepare the food, 
right up to when the food enters the mouth of the child. Mm -hmm. And so they will, there's a high degree of transparency, as you would know, from uh, this kind of technology mm -hmm. uh, to achieve those objectives. So we, uh, we have already garnered uh, a, a lot of interest from uh, corporates uh, throughout the country, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we've been talking to them for uh, more than a year. Mm -hmm and we're quite close to uh, coming up with something. So when we do, we hope that uh, organizations like yourselves would uh, uh, um, help us Definitely. to disseminate uh, the information. Exactly, and I'm, I'm sure that the blockchain community yes. will, upon hearing this, yes. this is music to their ears. Yes. <laughs> um, Tansri, that brings us to the end of our big talk series. Yes. It has been a great one hour. Um, I've been informed that uh, there are more people uh, watching us right now. Uh, I think the latest number was more than 300. Yes. Uh, we've been very, I've been very delighted you know, having, having these conversations with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Yang Berbahagia, Tansri Dr. Zati Aziz. Thank you, Tansri. Thank you.